Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to that Seafood That Guy channel. This is your boy, Seafood That Guy, speaking. And man, the year is over already. I feel like just yesterday, we were talking about our top five moments for One Piece in 2022. And now we're about to talk about our top five One Piece moments in 2022. Three. Before we get started, do us a solid drop a like on that video. Appreciate you guys getting these videos in the algorithm all year long. And if you don't mind, make sure you subscribe. Guys, we're trying to get to 500 before the year is over. Maybe we'll do it. Maybe we won't. Who knows? But help your brother out. Hit that sub button. Hit the notification bell because going into 2024, we will be dropping videos on a weekly basis. And we've been saying this catchphrase all year long. Let's get straight into it. Hey, listen. Yeah, so coming in at number five, I'm not even gonna hold any punches. This one I call Sabo's Secret, right? Now, I know everybody's mind collectively blew up when we finally got Sabo's perspective on the Reverie. And while we knew it was gonna be different, we definitely weren't expecting this. Not only did Sabo not kill King Cobra, which I'm pretty sure everybody knew that was the case, but in fact, he tried to save King Cobra. Save King Cobra from whom, you might ask? Well, that's a great question because Sabo barged in at the nick of time with King Cobra's meeting with the Gorusei. One emo appearance later, and all of a sudden, King Cobra had to sacrifice himself in order for Sabo to get out. His status is currently unknown, but with the knowledge that all of the Gorosei and Emu himself are all Devil Fruit users and combatants, well, King Cobra's fate really isn't looking too good right now. But this is Sabo's secret. Coming up in number four, this really shouldn't come to a surprise by anybody, but this is Kid's Divine departure from the story that is i mean like i said this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody i mean it just seems as if shank's ceiling cannot get any higher and then oda's like all right hold my beer i mean even at the end of wano when he essentially uses insane conquers hockey as a projectile to scare an admiral away. I mean, this man Shanks has clearly been shown to be the top tier when it comes to Conqueror's hockey in the verse. It's unfortunate nobody told Kid that though. After Wano, when Kid declared that he was going to find the man with the burned scar, our ears definitely pricked up with speculation as to who this person is and why Kid and Killer think that this person is so important to the race for the one piece well fast forward and kid ends up on the outskirts of elbath that's right you gotta love kids ambition and the man went straight for the grand prize unfortunately for him Shanks just happened to be there getting a drink with his bros and, well, the second meeting took place just like the first. Before Kid could even do anything, Shanks uses Future Sight to see exactly what Kid would do. He determined that Kid would use Damn Punk to destroy, I don't know, maybe half of Shanks' grand fleet, and Shanks was not having that. With one leap in the air and a divine departure later, the entirety of the kid pirates were left destroyed. Even with Killer getting in the way of the initial strike, it still wasn't enough to save Kid from his fate. After that, Dorian Bragi sunk the Victoria Punk to the bottom of the ocean and the kid pirates, as far as we can tell, are no more. I don't know if he survived, but there's always room in the Grand Fleet. This next one I call Law's Black Flash. And I'm not talking about JJK here. You'll see what I'm talking about in a minute. But similar to the former moment, this moment was equally as jaw dropping, especially since it was extended over, I don't know, two chapters or so. But at this point in the story, Oda was literally hurling everything at us. We understand that kid rushing in and getting molly by the first yonko that he sees well you know that makes perfect sense that tracks right but when it comes to law we expect him to approach it with a bit more 
impact, if you will. Unfortunately for him, the Yonko that he came across was none other than Blackbeard. And they never stood a chance. The attack was quick, it was swift, and all of a sudden, Law found themselves under an onslaught by not just Blackbeard, Doc Q, Jesus Burgess, Van Auger. I mean, even Stronger was there. It pains me to say it, but Oda clearly depicted Law putting up a fight. And even though I was pleasantly surprised to see that some of his crewmates weren't complete scrubs, the results ended up being the exact same thing as Kid with the Polar Tang getting destroyed and Law's entire crew getting wiped out, with the exception of Beppo, who used one of Chopper's Rumble Balls to go into an unexpected Sulong form just in order to grab Law and jump into the ocean. Law and Beppo escaped with their lives, but it's safe to say their journey for the One Piece is now over. Yo, there ain't no room on the sunny, but we got a dinky out back for all the new Grand Fleet members. I'm just saying. Yeah, so this next one's a big one. We've got Garp's Sacrifice. And this one was huge, not only because it was unexpected, but the build up to it was insane as well. We just came off a bunch of action packed chapters in Wano, and it was pretty easy to forget that there was a whole other global effort going on simultaneously with the world government effectively ending the seven warlords program and the marines proceeding to hunt down all the former warlords it was also revealed that sword was a thing within the marines and let's just say oda was hitting us with a lot but i feel like it all culminated at this moment now, Kobe, of course, is being held hostage in Hachinosu on Blackbeard's orders while Blackbeard went out and, and decided to go to town on Law. But while that's happening, Garp decides to get together a misfit ragtag group of sword members and storm Hachinosu in order to get Kobe back. We know that Garp is not the guy that's just gonna roll over and he doesn't even care what his higher ups say. He's gonna go get the job done and he would never let one of his subordinates like Kobe be kidnapped by a pirate and not attempt to get him back. So Garp pulls up and it gets crazy. The man jumps in and does a galaxy impact something we've never seen before. You know, it's up there with Whitebeard's Quake Fist and Roger's Divine Departure. I mean, Galaxy Impact looked like it basically wrecked the entire city square of Hachinosu. And this man, Garp, basically showed each of Blackbeard's members, at least the ones that were on Hachinosu, why he's no match for them, right? Alvaro Pizarro, he was a dub. Vasco Shot was a wash and even Shiryu of the Rain, even though he had some underhanded tactics and was even able to get a hit on Garp, well, Garp just kind of laughed it off and one-shot him. So, I mean, they were really no match for Garp until it boiled down to Garp versus Aokiji. And man, this battle definitely was sad to see Garp go up against his former student. And I'm not gonna lie, for a second there, everybody thought that Aokiji was about to get washed, right? Like, it didn't look good. However, in the end, Garp sacrificed himself so that Kobe and the rest of the younger Marines could get away. And he said, this is exactly what someone of Garp's stature would do to rescue his subordinates. He told them to get off of Hachinosu and get to safety with Kobe, and that is exactly what happened. Garp is the man. We don't know his status right now, but this moment was jaw-dropping and heartbreaking for just about everyone in the fan base. Coming up next, we got some honorable mentions, and these are just some of the moments that I feel like they're not exactly good enough to get an entire section in this video. However, we got to talk about them a little bit. And coming up first is St. J. Garcia Saturn's Devil Fruit. Now, if you're caught up with the manga, you know right now in Egghead, 
St. Jay Garcia is going to work on our crew. His Devil Fruit's been shown to us, but we have absolutely no idea what it is. It seems to be some sort of ancient zone, obviously, some sort of ancient spider mythical zone that nobody really knows what it is. Oda hasn't revealed it yet. However, the powers that it comes with that we've seen is crazy. I mean, the man's entrance into Egghead Island, he had literally Marines, Vice Admiral, or lower heads explode just by looking at him. Right now, he has the entire alliance frozen in place like they can't move i don't know if that's due to his devil fruit power i don't know if it's hockey or just due to sheer fear but this man is a monster so saint j garcia's devil fruit power i can't wait till oda reveals what it is and of course for the rest of the gorose my next honorable mention has to go to kuma's daughter being bonnie i mean i feel like a lot of the fan base pretty much speculated this when we saw her crying at the reverie we just didn't know what connection they had i feel like once people even feel that there's a connection between two characters in one piece they automatically assume some sort of actual relationship and even though kuma and bonnie are not related by blood they are father daughter and this was a super emotional reveal that is still being fleshed out in front of us in real time so of course we're not gonna talk too much about it because there's still things that we don't know however i just felt the need to mention it because it was something that was talked about for a long time and now we know bonnie is in fact the daughter of bartholomew kuma kuma's backstory honestly probably could have gotten uh you know a top five moments all for itself and maybe if you guys get in the comment section i might actually think about doing that because now that i'm thinking about it that actually seems like a really cool idea but that fits in well with our next top moment which is coming in at number one we have the reveal of saint Figurland Garland. Now, I don't know where Oda's headspace was when he decided to come up with this character, but man, he turned the fan base completely upside down. The design, the style, the introduction that this man Garland had into the story was just way too much for us as, the hand, as a fan base to handle. But not only that, he has the audacity to share the same recently revealed surname as Shanks. This man was the executioner for other celestial dragons? Oh man, Oda, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? As soon as we feel like we get the ceiling with certain characters, Oda decides to shatter that ceiling I remember how everybody was calling Shanks a snitch for being able to call a meeting with the Gorosei, but now everything is starting to make sense. If Shanks is indeed related to or the son of a celestial dragon and part of the Saint Figurlin family. Oda blew the doors wide open with the reveal of Saint Figurlin. And honestly, the Holy Knights are an un charted territory in the one piece story so far so we don't even know how far oda is gonna take this all we know is that figurlin looks badass he's op and he can kill other celestial dragons so let me know what you guys think about this top five let me know if you guys have any opinions of your of top five yourself if i missed anything if i'm crazy if all of these were just whack let me know in the comment section below of course, make sure you guys like the video. Make sure you guys subscribe. Help your boy out. Still trying to get to 500 before the year is up. But no, nah, happy new year to everybody out there. Happy new year to all my One Piece fans. It feels really good to be able to come online and like talk to you guys. So make sure you guys get in the comment section. Just let me know how you guys are doing. Hope you guys are staying safe, staying healthy. This is your boy Sifu, that guy coming to you live for the last time in 2023. And I will catch you guys next year. Peace.